Great. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining um, our seminar uh, uh, this afternoon's second seminar in our special series, Where Next for Public Housing. Um, my name is Halima Sikrani. Um, I am research lead of the Housing and Communities Research Group, um, and we are made up of um, housing researchers and lecturers, professors, associate professors, uh, all with a kind of common interest in housing policy research. And we undertake research in a range of areas from um, looking at housing policy governance, um, looking at community-led housing, community investment, resident engagement, uh, recently sustainability, uh, the third sector, uh, the, looking at the private rented sector and the exempt accommodation. So just a whole range of areas. Um, we're just really excited about the special series that we're currently running. Um, and I'm very delighted to welcome Professor Paul Watt, who will be delivering his talk today on estate regeneration and its discontents, public housing, place and inequality in London. Um, if you did get the email or LinkedIn post or invitation, you might have seen that it was uh, one of my colleagues, um, Dr. Stuart Smith, who was going to be chairing this, um, this afternoon session. But apologies, just due to a last uh, change um, circumstance, he's unable to be, be uh, here this afternoon. But I'm, I'm delighted to be able to welcome Paul and introduce him as well. So before I hand over to Paul, just a couple of logistics. Um, in terms of the program for this afternoon, um, Paul will be talking for about 40, 45 minutes to us this afternoon, um, after which we'll have a short break, just a sort of five minute comfort break, and then resume with a question and answer session of the program. Um, please feel free to make use of the chat window, the chat box, uh, and you know, pop in your questions and comments um, while, while sort of Paul is presenting to us. We won't come to those until the end, uh, but it's quite nice sometimes as as an, as sort of the discussion ensues to sort of pop a few comments in there or some questions you want to raise. Uh, we will start off with those questions first. So I'll I'll call on attendees um, and come to them first to sort of pop things in there. And of course, feel free to raise a little Zoom hand as well, and, and we'll come to you too. Um, the program is being recorded. It'll be Paul's part of the presentation, not the questions and answer uh, component. So just to make you aware of that as well. Um, yes, and then I think that's it. So just again, it's a very warm welcome and just delighted to see so many uh, attendees again today. Um, I'll just briefly tell you a little bit about Paul before I, I, I hand over to him. Uh, Paul is a professor of urban studies in the Department of Geography at Burbank University of London. He, as many of you will know, he's very widely published in social housing, particularly in this area around urban regeneration, um, focusing on London, sort of post Olympics, the London housing crisis, gentrification and, and suburbanization. And of course, the, the book that he'll be reflecting on and the research that went into it is, is around this is the one that you can see on your screen, which is a state regeneration and its discontents, um, looking at some of the um, social inequality implications of regeneration of estates in, in London. And I think what's really particularly interesting is looking at sort of multi-layered ways that sort of Paul has, has looked at uh, regeneration or degeneration from the sort of physical, social, the lived in experience. Uh, I know I'm particularly looking forward to hearing more of that. Um, and sort of Paul, again, he's, uh, you know, widely published, as you know, he's, he's the co-editor of, of Social Housing and Urban Renewal, um, uh, across national perspective, also co-edited London 2012 and the post Olympic City, and is a, a board member, editorial board member of the journal City and Housing and Society. So um, a very sort of esteemed speaker and we're very um, delighted to have you here with us, Paul. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over the, the Zoom mic to Paul. Uh, thanks very much, Halima. And uh, thanks very much to Stuart and for the Housing Communities Group at the University of Birmingham for uh, inviting me, uh, very pleased. Um, okay, so, um, I'm going to then talk about my book, which has just been published, State Regeneration's Discontents, which is a focus on state regeneration in London. The book is uh, theoretically located within a, sort of a melding together, really, of a whole bunch of different theoretical perspectives. So a lot of it's based around critical urbanism. It's also it draws upon Borgesian sociology, Weberian sociology. Uh, it also looks a lot at the geography and sociology of place attachment and place belonging. So a lot of the book is really about place and, place and uh, inequality, particularly social class, but not just class, race and gender as well. 
Uh, what I'm going to focus on, though, is the housing aspects of the book in this in this particular talk. So I'm going to give you a couple of questions, which uh, you can um, um, talk about in the in the chat. But uh, first is as to what uh, does anybody know what the estate is um, on the front of the cover of the book? And secondly, is this is a puzzle I set my students is okay so this is a map of social housing in london as you can see then the dark blue patches are in the center um so the question is why why is there so much social housing in the center of london whereas in paris it's the obverse paris then of course has got most of the social housing is on the outskirts so london then is very different so why so i'll um we can do those in the, in the chat later on all right, so the book begins with this statement, and this statement was at a meeting that I attended up in Tottenham, and uh, the part of Tottenham area, particularly around the Northumberland Park Estate, was going to be subject to a state, re state regeneration scheme under the aegis of the uh, Haringey Development Vehicle. And this was a comment that uh, one of the residents uh, at the meeting said, basically, I'm praying to God, don't regenerate my estate, because regeneration has become a nasty word. And in many ways, that comment is, is quite surprising, given the way that, you know, regeneration is meant to, you know, be, be, you know, be a positive, progressive policy. And certainly many people still regard it as that. What's happened over the last 10 years in London in particular is that the term itself, regeneration, has become, you know, derided. And in many ways, quite rightly, in my view. Um, Okay, so the book starts as well with this particular estate, the Carpenters Estate in uh, Stratford, in, in the borough of Newham. It's an estate that's been regenerating since, supposedly, since 2004-05. Um, it's a very complicated story, but essentially half the estate, half the tenants were decanted due to a, a, a regeneration scheme. By 20, uh, by 2012-2014, roughly about half the estate was empty. Now, what happened was that this estate was then the scene of a political occupation by the Focus E15 uh, housing group, which is basically a group of young mothers who had been living in a hostel in uh, Newham. Uh, and then they were basically told, uh, you know, they applied for social housing and, the, and they were told, well, you know, there isn't any in Newham, uh, it's not available. Uh, you know, the best we can do is to provide you some housing, but you might have to move, you, you have to move out of Newham, you know, you could move. Uh, to uh, somewhere in the southeast, or you could, you know, move as far away as Manchester or Birmingham. What happened was then that the, the Focus D50 campaign uh, it formed to protest about this. They formed a campaign called Social Housing, Not Social Cleansing, and they discovered that, uh, you know, just uh, a half a mile from where they where they hold their weekly stall in Stratford Broadway. That the Carpenters estate was empty. So they did a political occupation in 2014, which really highlighted in many ways, many of the contradictions and frankly, the absurdities of what's going on in relationship to housing right now. And you can see the banners at the uh, front of the occupied flats. <clears throat> These people need homes. These homes need people. So there are, so, you know, again, state regeneration is supposed to provide more homes. Well, you know, in many ways, what it's done is it's emptied out perfectly decent council homes which have stood empty and people could have used these um, but that's not that's not what's happened right so i'm sure that everybody will on this call will be familiar with slides like this it basically shows you then housing completions this one's from 19 uh, 1980 to 2017 and you can see what's happened is very clear that the blue line that the slump in local authority housing production if in London, if you go back to the six, the 70s, you're talking getting close to 30,000 homes were built a year. And but in, even in the early years of the Thatcher government, you know, you're still talking about 15, 10,000 homes being built. But by the time then that you get to John Major's government, it pretty much uh, you know, more or less evaporates and it flatlines. And but the surprising thing politically about this, and this is absolutely unprecedented in relationship to um, you know, the, the, the Labour Party politics is the way that there was no uptick after 1997 to 2010. So essentially, you know, it's something we could debate at length, but the new Labour government, is, it, it cut the legs off this particular aspect of the welfare state. 
five pillars of the welfare state. Housing was one of them back in 1945. And then in 1997, essentially then, um, you know, this was the aspect of the welfare state, which New Labour more or less pretty much abandoned in many kind of ways, certainly in terms of new production. Housing associations, it increased uh, the, other, the other wing of social housing, but by nowhere near the amount of the, uh, the, the reduction of local authority house production. And then again, I'm sure people know these slides, but uh, the annual right to buy in London then. So roughly from a period from 1980 to uh, 2017, something in the region of 285,000 council homes were sold in London, roughly a third of the stock. And again, uh, you know, certainly the new labor increased the discounts uh, and, you know, sales did fall, but didn't get rid of uh, the uh, right to buy. Uh, and then since uh, Osborne then increased the discounts in 2011, I think it was uh, right to buy sales have gone up again. So these are all, you know, so, so there's clearly a shrink, massive shrinkage of, of local authority housing. Uh, Labour's big claim to fame was, of course, the Decent Homes programme. And, um, you know, yes, in many ways it was, you know, uh, successful, but the success, you know, have to qualify it. And I do talk about this quite a bit in the book about, you know, how the Decent Homes programme, you know, rather than a New Labour, instead of, instead of, you know, giving the money directly to the local authorities, what it did, it put in place this complex series of, uh, of, of, of governance arrangements, PFI, stock transfers and armors. Uh, and that was, you know, so local authorities didn't have the money to actually, uh, to, you know, to, to uh, refurbish and re the stock. The, the, the typical figure is that by the time you get to 1997, there was a, there was a £19 billion pound shortfall of maintenance repairs in the local authority housing sector uh, nationally. So that was Labour's uh, attempt to renew that, but it's very, it's very cumbersome and it's very slow. But what's interesting as well is that, you know, London had got always a high proportion of non-decent homes. So back in 2001, two, 55%, but even by 20, uh, 2009, 10, when the whole thing was supposed to be finished and completed, still a quarter of London homes were non-decent. And there's a particular interaction effect between this and um, regeneration, which I'll talk about in a minute. All right, so the official discourse in the state demolition, state regeneration, is that you know state, existing estates are sink estates they run down they contain little of value they're failed places uh they're spatially excluded places and then the way then is that regeneration is uh, generally regarded as a win-win there are no losers it's very difficult if you read any of the kind of the official reports to see that there's any account that anybody might, might be disadvantaged by this process and it solves a lot of existing problems relatively quickly and painless, and it doesn't generate any further problems. None of these things, of course, is true. Uh, this was a, a report done uh, a few years ago. Uh, it's a comment from David Luntz, who was the uh, executive director at the GLA at the time, basically talking then about this uh, huge number of successful estate regeneration projects. Kidbrook, Woodbury Down, Clapham Park, Graham Park, South Acton, West Hendon. The state's being transformed all across London. Well, yes, they are, but not in the way that David Luntz and others seem to think. I looked at some of these estates and I'll talk about those in a minute. Right, so the rationale then, why do, you know, why not the states down? Well, there are basically four main sets of reasons. The first reason is social. Uh, you solve problem with states, uh, you know, you prevent neighborhood effects, you can create mixed tenure communities, the architectural aesthetic reasons, you modernize properties, better design standards, the economic, you leave it in private finance, the demographic is the densification argument. When there's populations rising, so you'll then hence solve the, the, you know, you build more homes on the footprints of estates and you solve the housing crisis. What the book does, though, is it traces the, these, the, the, the importance of these four aims has shifted over time. So if you go back to uh, the 1980s and 1990s, uh, essentially the second two, the three, sorry, the, the last two, the economic and the demographic weren't important. In fact, there was, you know, if you look at the 1990s, 1980s and 1990s schemes in London, there was actually a net reduction in the amount of homes. So there were de-densification projects. Under Labour, uh, what happened was that particularly the social uh, uh, aim became particularly important. And what's happened post Labour is that the social has, has become much less significant and certainly the uh, three and four have become much, much more important. Although, you know, the, those aims will become important under Labour as well. 
So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go into this in detail, uh, but uh, essentially then what happened is that from the 80s and 90s, uh, a lot of the state regeneration programs were, 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 were publicly funded, estate action, SRB, some private funding, but a lot of it was actually public funding. Uh, Labour then was more ambitious, uh, it certainly had a, a much wider scale, uh, you know, um, uh, state regeneration program as in the New Deal for Communities, but it didn't actually put uh, enough public money in, it put a lot of public money in, but not enough. So under New Labour, there was increased expectation that uh, the private sector would pick up the slack in all kinds of ways. And then since austerity in the 2010s, uh, the central local government funding has shrunk dramatically, so there's increasing reliance on private sector for funding. So you can actually see the results of this if you compare two early and two later uh, schemes. So the, the earlier schemes then a comprehensive estates initiative in Hackney and the Peckham SRB in Southwark. And what you can see there is is that there's yeah there's a significant loss of social housing and that's part related to the overall reduction in density but what happens at the end of the scheme is that still the majority of the properties are social renting 75 percent in hackney and 83 percent in in, in uh, peckham um, and the market homes is actually you know minority now when you move on to the later schemes which have begun under under the labor years then will be down in the haygate you can see there and particularly the haygate the haygate is really the poster child in many ways for uh, for you know it's, it's probably the worst case in relationship to the reduction of social homes in london and you can see a massive reduction in social homes in, in the haygate um, and then at the end of the day you get this most very very few social rental homes are provided uh, and most homes then are three quarters then are market homes for sale. Uh, Woodbury Down is, is certainly a much less extreme case than um, the Haygate, uh, but still, nevertheless, uh, you know, at the end of the scheme, whenever it finishes, 2035 possibly, is that still social housing will be in the minority and market homes there will dominate. So there's a transformation over the years. So what I do in the book then is I look at a bunch of estates uh, and primarily in the, the boroughs that are shaded uh, dark there. So I look at West Hendon in Barnet, so I look at Northumberland Park in Harringay, I look at Woodbury Down and, and Northwold in Hackney, I look at the Carpenters Estate and Canning Town and Custom House in Newham, I look at the Asian Estate in Tower Hamlets, I look at the Aylesbury Hager in its Dulwich Estates in Southwark, and in, in Lambeth, I look at Clapham Park, Cressingham Gardens, and to a lesser extent, Westbury and Central Hill. Now, all of these estates, they're all subject to uh, partial or full demolition, but they're incredibly architecturally varied. So, and this is one of the things, again, you often have these kind of cliched notions of what an estate is. And the cliches tend to revolve around uh, some version of uh, the Aylesbury estate on the right hand side. Uh, you know, modernist, brutalist, etc., etc. all those kind of descriptions. Many London estates, of course, no, no, nothing like that. The Aylesbury, in many ways, is, is, is quite, uh, quite unusual. The Aylesbury is, is, the, is the largest estate in inner London, 2,700 properties. Crescent Gardens, on the other hand, this low-rise estate just next to Brockwell Park, 306 properties. So there's incredible variation right across London in terms of the... Um, <clears throat> the design and the scale of, of, of council estates. Now, part two of the book, what I do there is I'm really interested, I'm really interested in examining the question of what, what do people value about estates as places to live in? So it's really very much, it's that Weberian questions. How do people put meaning on their experience in the places that they live in? And a lot of people, it's very clear amongst the interviewees that I did, I should just say I interviewed about 180 uh, uh, residents. Um, a lot of people do value the places that they live. They consider them to be their homes. Uh, there's a sense of ownership, pride. And of course, a lot of this is linked up to the way that uh, council housing, apart from if you're an outright owner occupier, it's probably the most secure uh, housing tenure that, that one can have. And many of the people I spoke to they were long-term residents. They'd lived at their flats or their houses uh, for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Some people had lived there all their lives. So there's a real sense of, you know, in, in Giddens' terms, ontological security. People regard it as their space through, through you know, a lot of it, through dint of 
uh, longevity uh, and through the fact that, you know, because of the security of tenure, uh, tenants do then feel that this is their home. And you can see there on the left hand side, you can see, uh, you know, uh, uh, cared for gardens at uh, uh, West Hendon Estate. And then the photograph on the right is of a tenant on Northumberland Park Estate in Tottenham. Uh, who spent several thousand pounds on basically internally changing his flat. As he said, you know, it was his home. He wanted to make it into what, how he wanted it, basically. So, again, one of the myths about council tenants and about social tenants generally is that they don't care about their home because they're tenants. It's absolutely uh, untrue. Also then in terms of the neighborhoods, thinking about the neighborhood scale, it's clear that, uh, you know, people do very much value the places that they live. Uh, there on the left hand side, you've got the ocean estate, that's a view out of a tenant's window, uh, you know, and you very much, you know, and enjoy living in this particular estate. On the right hand side, you have uh, Central Hill Estate in Lambeth, and again, there you can see the, uh, the banner outside one of the flats, Save Central Hill Community. So, the idea that these are places which people simply, you know, have got no investment in, no interest in, uh, is, is simply fallacious. And, you know, this is a quote from um, a tenant, uh, actually a single parent up in West Hendon Estate, uh, you know, and very much yeah, expresses the sense that, uh, you know, there was some sort of sense of community there, close to a parent, she can walk to work. Also then, uh, you know, it's uh, conveniently located, amenity shops, stations, the community feeling. And then it's important here, this is, if I'm delayed at a hospital, I trust my neighbors. They could just spend a few minutes with the kids if they didn't have a key, if the kids didn't have a key for some reason. This is very important. Again, people, you know, Danny lived at this West End for about 20 years. So what happens over this time is that people, uh, you know, form relationships with their neighbours and, you know, there's a sense, what's what Lisa McKenzie calls local social capital. People get a sense of who to trust and who not to trust. However, uh, chapter seven of the book talks about devaluation. In other words, what happens is despite the many of the inherent values that people have got about estates, estates have become devalued in all kinds of ways. Uh, partly due to overcrowding in particular, uh, partly due, well, in fact, a lot of it is due to neglect, landlord disinvestment, transient places. I'm not really going to talk about that, but it can do increasingly as states have become uh, uh, more transient as a result of the knock-on effects of the right to buy and private landlordism, disorderliness in relationship to crime and SAB, which is a problem with some estates, but much, much less so at other estates. And of course, territorial stigmatization, uh, the kind of issues that uh, Lloyd Wilkant uh, talks about. So I'm not going to go through these in, in detail, but essentially then one of the big issues and the people who I would say amongst I interviewed who were most in favor of state demolition were those people who were overcrowded. Uh, and that was a particular issue in some cases. Uh, and, and really, and the, the overcrowding reflects the long-term uh, decline in social renting. People are overcrowded, they, they apply for a transfer, but essentially then they're stuck on the way, they're stuck on the, uh, the transfer list for years and years, incredibly frustrating. This was from a, a quote at a meeting I attended in Broadwater Farm. Um, and a female tenant there saying, I lived on the eighth floor of a tower block 16 years. It's not about the estate and the estate as a whole. It's about her, the home, her individual circumstances. She's got three kids in a one bed flat. They all sleep in one bed. I don't need to invite people back because I'm so ashamed of the place. Nothing happens. People don't care. I want to move out. So in other words, what's happened is then a process of unhoming has taken place uh, you know, as a result of the overcrowding. And as I said, uh, people who are uh, overcrowded were generally the people who I found to be most in favour of demolition because it offered a way out, it offered this a way out of the desperate circumstances that they were living in. Uh, people also then complained a lot about the fact that simply, you know, although they described the, uh, the, the homes themselves, the dwellings, the flats and the houses as being inherently solid, solid was the word that uh, many, many council tenants used about their properties, um, they feel that they've been neglected. And that roof there, again, is at Northumberland Park Estate. Uh, and this wasn't atypical. I have lots of photographs of roofs like that. 
Uh, and then the, the quote on the right from Monica then, uh, basically then what happens is that she lives in a, a house on the estate that it gets periodically flooded. And then she's basically saying, uh, you know, that her home's for Haringey. Uh, as far as she was concerned, they left this home to deteriorate. I've been here, they don't do any work. I haven't seen them do any external improvements. The only thing they do is cut the grass, clean the rubbish, but generally there's no upkeep. That was a familiar kind of light motif. Uh, you know, that the basically the, there wasn't enough being done to maintain the estates. Uh, and also then, uh, you know, stigmatised places, so I was spelling out of there, um, stigmatised places then, estates then are routinely stigmatised. Uh, there you have a story, this is a Churchill Gardens estate in Westminster then, there you have a story then, somebody gets stabbed in a street nearby, uh, and then... Um, the story describes it. The street is yards from the gang play Churchill Gardens estate. Uh, what happened then was that back in 2014, part of the estate was potentially threatened with demolition. There was a staying put save the gardens meeting. Uh, over 40 uh, residents were there. And there, you know, people, people say, you know, people were commenting on the way that the external place image, the sink of state, doesn't resonate with their own um, lived experiences and the straw poll people who want to go and leave and nobody wanted to leave so let's then start talking then so that's the pre-regeneration uh, so then when regeneration gets underway what happens well the first stage really is sort of consultation and uh you know the book you know, talks a lot about consultation but Again, I'm simplifying it, but essentially the argument is that the some of the consultations that I looked at um, that they that, you know that they were problematic in different kinds of ways. This is again, this Northumberland Park Estate, uh, which was subject to the HDV, the Hungry the Development Vehicle, and this is the statements that were given to residents as part of the consultation exercise. Northumberland Park should be made up of attractive places with a range of different buildings and open spaces, 86% agree. Regeneration should deliver high quality new housing for local people and maximise opportunities for the local agreement, 87% agree. There should be more cultural community facilities, 88% agree. Well, the point about those statements is that they're hard to disagree with. You would it'd be virtually impossible. If you actually think about it, how could you uh, put a no negative against that? That you, that you think that uh, regeneration should not deliver high quality new housing for local people. These are essentially bland statements. And the point, one of the points I make in the book is that the word demolition, the opportunity costs of what one is going to what one might have to lose in order to get these benefits uh, in some cases weren't spelled out also there's a sense from some uh, residents that there's a devaluation of their experiences what they value this was at the haygate estate which has now uh, been uh, demolished this was from an ex-tenant who'd lived there for 30 years over 30 years describing a consultation then that she went to that to the consultants were going to make new maisonettes make trees and avenues then the way then the estate was spoken about was it's a blank space we're going to give you infrastructure and as she says then this comment uh, riled her because she's like well we've already got a lot of infrastructure there she talks about the buses down the Walworth road the hospitals the Eurostar at the time uh, and basically, so there's a mismatch between, you know, external, uh, in some cases, external views and internal uh, residents' views of place. Uh, yeah, I won't, I, won't, I, won't, I won't go about that. Okay, so what then happens then is that one regeneration, you know, once you move beyond the consultation stage, is that really what happens is that regeneration, it turns into a process of degeneration. Uh, because one of the important things about this as well, I should say, is that is that regeneration takes an incredibly long time. Uh, and, and also uh, pretty much every estate that I looked at, the original time scales doubled, if not tripled. So you're talking about estate regeneration schemes, which are gonna be going on for 10, 20, 30 uh, uh, years. The Ellsbury estate isn't due to finish until about 2035, having been part of an, a new deal for communities program back in 2000. So that's half of people's lifetimes. So, you know, this is an incredibly lengthy process. What happens then is a process of managed decline, residents experience worsening repairs and maintenance. The original estate infrastructure that they liked and valued is lost. 
you have empty homes and squatting, you have increased transient population, people live on a building site, the mass media transforms states into urban dystopian film sets, as particularly happened at the Haygate, but not just the Haygate, and it's never ending, residents end to this limbo land. So I'll just illustrate a few of these points. Uh, yeah, this is non-decent homes data. Uh, sorry, yeah, non-decent homes data. Clan Park, there was an NDC. Uh, you know, I should just say the 2002 Clan Park figure is an estimate, but nevertheless, I'm pretty sure it's, it's more or less accurate. The point is then that, uh, you know, what happens then over 2002 to 2008, the, uh, the, the six years of the NDC, is that there's no improvement whatsoever in the Clapham Park non-decent homes. Lambeth, of course, is reduced, London's reduced, England's reduced, but not Clapham Park. Why? Because the home's on, a, because it's on a regeneration uh, state. And regeneration then is basically, the, so the decent homes program was halted or, or, or you know, stopped basically. Uh, because these estates were then going to be uh, demolished and supposedly regenerated. I went to Clapham Park in 2008 uh, and I was, I remember in the field notes, I was quite shocked at the fact that, uh, you know, this was supposedly a flagship NDC scheme uh, and, uh, you know, the conditions that I found there were pretty bad. Uh, 2016, I went back and, uh, well, I have to say the conditions were, in some ways, they've, they've done certainly done some dumb things. There's some more greater security around some of the blocks of flats in the West. But nevertheless, again, uh, the process of managed decline had carried on, really. So you get a loss of valued space. Uh, so areas then of green space, for example, will get built on. This is uh, Cheryl at West End, and the kids used to play football out the back. And uh, the regeneration then has smashed the community because those sort of facilities are no longer there. And then people have the misery of living on a building site. Again, this is West Hendon, it's a couple of uh, residents, Lily and Vicky. Uh, and then basically then, uh, you know, they, they have this building works and the noise and the dust, constant issues around that the works, is, there's supposed to be a statutory period that work's supposed to carry on. Residents are constantly saying, you know, it's carrying on beyond the statutory minimum. And basically, as Lily says, it's made, this is going to drive me mad. It's made people ill. And people do suffer physical and mental illness as a result of this. As I said, then, you know, what then happens is that it's a limbo land. It's like Samuel Beckett's waiting for Godot, and of course, Godot never arrives. Um, and so, again, this is a couple of the meeting I attended in 2015 at the Ellsbury. By then, the Ellsbury NDC had been going for 15 years. The quote at the bottom, I remember the guy saying this. He was, just, he was attending a regeneration meeting. He just didn't want to be there because uh, essentially he'd been sick and tired of like, you know, attending meetings for years and years and years. Just want to get on with my life. Um, and the Ellsbury itself there, you've got the photograph on the right, is the, the way then it became basically forted up. It became a fortress. And even residents who were, residents are still living in those blocks. Uh, they would then struggle to gain access to their own homes. So again, it's a degenerative process. And I went back recently to Clapham Park West and, uh, you, you know, the physical appearance of this is not, uh, I think one has to say, is not fantastic. Many broken windows again, uh, you know, the, uh, the doors the, the, to the streets not properly uh, maintained. And as this elderly tenant said to me, this was actually a quote from back in 2016, regeneration is a gimmick. Uh, all my friends were waiting for some sort of improvement um, and they just died. And that's one of the issues is that this process takes so long, it goes on for so long and, uh, you know, elderly tenants, uh, tragically, uh, some of them die as a result of this. So what, the, one of the points I make is that estates in London are, are unjustly described as sink estates, but what happens is that the degeneration process itself actually creates the sink estate experience. This was for a quote from a Labour councillor who was uh, assisting tenants at West Hendon. Uh, and basically she's talking about the, 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 the residents were complaining constantly to about what's going on, about the dust, the mould, the antisocial behaviour. So what's happened is that the estate turned into a parody of an estate. Uh, so it, that's what 
that's that's the kind of the take the state takes physically takes on the appearance and socially becomes a much more anomic space as uh, you know you have uh, tenants moved in tenants moved off decanted you have uh, new people moved in you have uh, uh, temporary tenants squatters uh, and you have property guardians so the whole for those remaining tenants the estate then uh, is is very much a degenerative space that's uh, um, the photograph on the left is from a temporary tenants bathroom the tile the tiles fell, fell off a wall uh, and as she says that when she rang up the uh, the council to 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 repair them uh, you know basically they didn't do it because uh, you know you're on a regen scheme basically uh, in terms of displacement i could talk about a lot about this but uh, the those people not everybody silly by no means and many people particularly leaseholders don't return to the original uh, estates um, and uh, you know many count secure council tenants don't either but some do so it depends on depends on the amount of reprovision the extent of the reprovision of social housing um, but I argue then that you need to look at it at three at three scales the domestic scale of the homes the intermediate scale of the block of flats and the neighborhood scale of the estate so at the domestic scale, you tend to get a sort of a polarised opinion. So it's those people then who have been previously unhomed, because a lot of it, as I said, because they're overcrowding, they then often welcome the new homes. And this is a quote then from Lorraine, a single parent with a couple of kids, you know, and she was then very pleased that she'd moved into a new housing association, but new place, it's big, it's double the size, her daughter's got her own room, her son's got, has got a room, so, you know, it actually did provide, in that sense, a new home. However, other people, they move in the opposite direction. They valued their previous local authority homes for all kinds of reasons then, and they move into a position of being unhomed. Uh, again, this is Pat then, uh, and basically then she compares the solidity that she had with the old flat concrete flint solid building. And there she says what she's got now is a piece of balsa wood. And that's a pretty typical kind of criticism of the, um, the, the, the new homes that people move into. Uh, and as she says, you can hear people upstairs doing it, having sex, basically. <coughs> these, these photographs are at West Hendon. And, and this shows you, I took these from one of the tenants uh, themselves, Annie, who, and that was her before and after photographs of what she, the view that she had uh, on the left hand side before she moved out in her old council flat, looking onto the green space on the, on the estate. And that then was the view that she had in her new block after she'd moved. And that's Annie talking about it. I end the book with that. Uh, and again, Many of the people I spoke to were middle-aged or elderly. And, you know, she says, you know, it's a very, very disruptive time, particularly if it's something that you don't want to happen. And uh, <laughs> you know, it's quite traumatic. And there's a sense of bereavement, certainly for those people uh, you, know, who, um, you know, invested time, love, care in their previous homes, basically. Importantly, you have to think about the design aspects uh, and um, one of the aspects about the old council estates, again, this is West Enden, and these, these are the Maisonette's uh, blocks, the flat, blocks and flats uh, on the left. What you have is external walkways. So in order for people to get into their own flats, they have to walk past their neighbor's flats. So there's a, there's, there's a constant sense of, of movement, mobility. People can see other people. And as you can see there, what happens is that uh, people use the balconies as an extension of their home. They, they put their kids' bikes there, and in the summer, they sit out. On the right-hand side, this is the new block, and this is typical. This is not in any way atypical. This is, I went into many of the new blocks on different estates, and this is a typical kind of view. Windowless internal corridors, and people don't see anybody. And the routine way that people spoke about this was in terms that they were living in a hotel. It felt like living in a hotel. Anonymous places, what Mark Oud, the anthropologist Mark Oud calls uh, non-places. Uh, so there's a loss of sense of, 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 of neighbourliness, basically. People don't see anybody anymore. So again, a couple of quotes from Lorraine to illustrate that. And as I said, Lorraine was very happy with her home itself, but she was much less happy with the, uh, the blocks, basically. And she says on the left, the way the buildings were designed, you could see your neighbors every day. As she says, uh, you know, um, 
if, if anyone was at home, you would know they came out and the chairs outside, you know who's coming and going. And then she describes on the right hand the new end of waterside facilities. Um, new buildings are not the same. You don't have that balcony and people are isolated. So, and then you get to the issues around, you know, well, okay, so you have then a mix, you have a 10 year mix. So you have then the uh, you know, remaining social uh, tenants and social blocks, some of which are new blocks. And then you have the new private uh, apartments that are built uh, to subsidize the regeneration. And the aim then, as it will be down, is to create these balanced and integrated communities. Um, well, my you know the chapter 12 talks particularly about Woodbury Down and West Hendon and it's difficult to see much balance or integration there you have a photograph on the left of the blocks that you're still standing council tenants are still living in there uh, and uh, you know they <clears throat> so you know that that's the old estate and then on the new estate and on the right hand side you have the entrance then to the um, the, um, the new or the new luxury apartment blocks with a concierge lobby etc cetera, etc cetera. so the idea that these are balanced or integrated i think is 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 problematic and as then a temporary tenant who lived on the uh, the north side of um, um, Seven Sisters Road in one of the old blocks says, there's no young professionals this side of the road, it's mainly old tenants or people being put here due to homelessness or young families. So there's a, there's a class, you know, in social class terms, there's a class chasm between what's going on at one part of side of the road and what's going on at the other side of the road. And you can I went back to Woodbury Down recently uh, and you can see this, this is literally the opposite side of the road. You have an advert then on the left-hand side where one of the new social housing blocks is, for food banks and on the right hand side then is an advert for fine dining which is what the new uh, tenants uh, the new residents of the private apartment blocks can look forward to so uh, i argue then that uh, the schemes that i've looked at essentially it's a state-led gentrification demolition acts as a class game changer on steroids in all kinds of ways the symbolic and the socio-spatial aspects of class are publicized and accentuated rather than neutered. There's a loss of social rental homes. The land values are unlocked in the jargon, house prices, private and social rents all increase even in the surrounding areas. So the local area becomes less affordable for low middle income people. Some people might have seen this. This is taken from the London Housing Assembly report, uh, looking at 50 schemes involving demolition. Uh, and there you can see there's a rough eight to 27 percent reduction in the number of social homes um, and then the number of market homes then goes up by a thousand percent for three thousand and thirty six thousand so basically what what the regeneration is doing is it's producing these you know uh, islands of gentrification basically and the Hager again is 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 in many ways the the you know the the poster child for this process. Uh, you know it's now been transformed into Elephant Park, uh, and the latest phase of that set to complete in 2024. Uh, you can gain access to those new properties at a starting price of 634,000 pounds, which is not really likely to be much use to um, working class people in Southwark. And a recent report was done, didn't put these in the book, by Austin Holmes. And what they looked at, they looked at uh, areas then, looked at 10 areas across London. And what they found is that house prices increase in London degeneration areas. And as private rents follow house, you know, there's a connection clearly. So then basically what it means then is that the local area becomes even, as I said, even less affordable. So um, we'll do that. Yeah, and all of these things then, many of the states that I've looked at, they've been contested in all kinds of ways. Residents have banded together. Uh, this uh, on the left-hand side is Safe Northwold in Hackney. On the right-hand side then is, this was outside the Royal Courts of Justice for the Judicial Review, uh, again, uh, criticizing the Haringey Development Vehicle. Uh, this process and the fact that so much, you know, uh, you know, the fact that this has become a controversial process meant then that was uh, Sadiq Khan was talking about trust and basically saying then that uh, the development industry must learn to speak the languages that used by communities, do some active listening. So there's clearly a sense 
from the political class that uh, this hasn't this process hasn't exactly gone smoothly. Anyway, so then at the finish of the book, uh, I talk then about some things that I think the regeneration industry should try and do. We build trust, acknowledge that you're an outsider, perceptions of the states are partial. Uh, I'm not going to go through them all. Recognize that you're dealing with people's homes, stop material in symbolically running estates down, move away from consulting residents towards treating them as experts through a genuinely dialogic form of participation. Uh, don't stop pretending the comprehensive redevelopment is relatively quick. Don't be shy about the D word in, de in consultation. And then publicize how these processes are stressful. Uh, and uh, yeah, emphasize that regeneration will take years and decades. And actually some elderly residents won't be alive to see the results. Um, and um, yeah, and then some uh, comments at the end about the role of temporary tenants who get located onto estates. Uh, on a temporary basis, some of whom though can actually remain there up to 10 years. Okay, so that's the talk and that's the, uh, the shameless commercial plug. Uh, so if anybody's interested, you can get a 25% uh, discount if you uh, order then through um, Policy Press. Uh, and that's then available for the people on this call that Policy Press kindly um, um, facilitated. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, thanks for listening. That's the talk. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Paul. That was just you know, really interesting and so um, rich with um, you know, it's qualitative empirical data. It was brilliant to see all the, the quotes as well from the, the many, many interviews you did.